When I was younger and I had obesity, one of the main questions I would ask is why is it so difficult for me and so easy for so many other people? And just a look at society will show you that we come in all different sizes and shapes and some people we do see are more likely to become obese than others. What are some of the reasons for this? So genetics plays a significant role in our likelihood to develop obesity. And I'm always careful when I say this because I think a lot of people have an instant reaction to be like, well, you're just trying to excuse obesity on genetics. And that's just not what we're trying to do here. This is what the evidence shows. The evidence shows that individuals with certain genetic mutations are at an increased risk for obesity. That doesn't mean they absolutely will become obese. It just means that it's harder for some people than others. There's so much evidence to support this. Some of the earliest evidence to show this is just to look at twins. Identical twins have the same genes. And we find that with identical twins, they are way more likely to have a similar BMI compared to what we call fraternal twins, ones with different um, DNA. So there's something going on in genetics that increases the likelihood that a BMI or a weight will be at a certain level. Also, another good piece of evidence for genetics influencing our size and our shape is chances are your body looks a lot like your mother or your father or your aunt or someone else in your family's body at your age. Because again, our bodies are influenced by the size and structure of our body is influenced by genetic factors that are passed down um, by our family. Some of, for me, some of the strongest evidence that supports the link between genetics and obesity are these things called genome-wide association studies. So these are fascinating. These are studies where they're like, they have no hypothesis. Researchers have no hypothesis. They're just like, we have all this genome data. We have all this data of the genetic makeup of all these individuals, hundreds of thousands of individuals from around the world. Okay, let's look at the genetic information of individuals with obesity and compare that to the genetic makeup of individuals that don't have obesity. Are there certain genetic changes that are more likely in individuals with obesity than not? That's one of the questions that were asked by the gen these genome-wide association studies. Don't worry too much about all the specifics in this slide. Each of these little bars represents one genetic location where there is a mutation that is more likely to exist in individuals with obesity. There are about a hundred genetic changes or something we call single nucleotide polymorphisms that are more likely in individuals with obesity compared to individuals that don't have obesity. So what we know is that obesity is rarely caused by a single gene mutation. Although that does occur sometimes, it's usually polygenic in nature, which means that a bunch of different changes in our genes kind of add together to, to lead to an increased risk of obesity. To me, the most fascinating part of these studies is that they found that the majority of the genetic changes occurred in and around genes associated with appetite. And it is now believed that obesity, one of the main reasons that leads to obesity, is appetite dysregulation, in part due to uh, genetic changes that maybe increase someone's drive to eat and decrease someone's feelings of fullness as well around food. Add that to an environment where food is everywhere and there's no surprise that we have so much obesity in our, in our society. When I talk about the cause of obesity, I'm always going to say that they're complex. When I say complex, it's more than complicated. It means that things can be caused by a whole slew of reasons and interacting variables and that these variables can change over time and sometimes they appear to happen at random. And this diagram right here, it's something called the foresight model of obesity or map of obesity. Each of these little boxes right here shows a different evidence-based factor that has been shown to increase a person's risk for obesity. And they've grouped all these factors into categories. So we're going to go through each of these categories, but remember that each of these have different 
aspects to them and everything is related. And I would say if someone's dealing with obesity, chances are they have their own map. They have their own set of reasons that are often like compounding themselves that increase their risk for obesity. So for one thing that increases our risk for obesity is eating too much. And one of the things that affects how much we eat is our appetite regulation. And this is probably the, the, the thing I like talking about the most. Like I mentioned, our hypothalamus is this area in, kind of in the center of our brain and it's our drive center. It's got our sex drive there. It's got our like water drive as well. Our temperature regulation center is there as well. And this hypothalamus which, uh, which ultimately leads to the drive to consume, the drive to eat, is receiving messages from all over the body, both the internal system, and it's also receiving messages from the external environment as well. And these messages ultimately affect appetite, hunger, and satiety. Appetite is the overall drive to consume, and it can be influenced by hunger, but not always. So hunger is the like need to eat. It's the like brrr, the rumbling in your stomach or the feeling of tiredness because you haven't eaten enough and you're low energy. Hunger can influence appetite, but I think we all know that we also tend to eat even when we're not hungry. Okay, so appetite is the overall drive to consume. Satiety, we could argue, is the opposite of, of appetite. Satiety, I like to think of it as the breaks. Okay, I like to think of appetite as the accelerator and satiety as the break. Satiety is that, that stop signal. Okay, so don't consume. It tells your hypothalamus, don't eat so much. And all of these are being influenced, like I said, by a whole slew of factors. Remember that our fat cells secrete leptin. One of the adipokines our, our fat cells secrete is leptin, which acts on the appetite center to promote satiety, the stop signal. Our digestive tract secretes a whole number of factors, including something called CCK, including, including something called GLP-1, including something called ghrelin that also act on the appetite center to influence appetite. And we're discovering more and more the bacteria in our gut also influences appetite, but the exact mechanisms by which it does so we're still exploring. In addition, other things that affect appetite are our thoughts, how we feel about food or what we're thinking about food, and our emotions too. I'm sure all of us have sometimes eaten because we're sad and like food makes us feel good. It provides like a ding, ding, ding to the brain. And that's why regulating our emotions is so important to overall well-being, but also to appetite control too. Okay, and then our food environment is often influencing our food consumption too. Okay? And our food environment has one big message. It's eat, 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 eat all the time. We call this the obesogenic environment. It's an environment that really promotes eating and, tr and often like limits the amount of physical activity we get. Food today, it's very high in calories. It's often nutrient poor, especially these like highly processed foods, ultra processed foods, Nova Group 4 foods. And also it's everywhere and it's cheap. Plus it's kind of like fun to buy food. You know, you only have five bucks. Well, you can buy like a lot of candy for five bucks. You know, like it's, it's kind of part of our culture to constantly be consuming and our environment, you know, food manufacturers, food producers, they want us to consume and they've done a lot of things to influence our food choices so we eat more. Also, our psychology can impact how much we eat. Like we mentioned, our, our emotional drive, our emotional center talks to our appetite center. And sometimes when our emotions are kind of out of whack, we might say, our appetite might actually go up or it might go down as well. Our individual psychology can also affect how much activity we're getting. You know, if someone's dealing with depression, let's say, maybe they don't feel like being active or going for a walk or anything like that. Stress is something else that can affect both eating and physical activity patterns. And as we go through these different factors for obesity, and maybe if someone that's watching this, maybe you that's watching this is struggling with these issues, a good thing to think about is where am I kind of struggling the most and where might be a good place to start to improve this relationship with food and physical activity and get myself to a size that I feel comfortable with. 
Also, our social psychology can influence both how much we eat and how much we exercise. So this is like, yeah, the, the kind of psychology of the groups that we run in. You know, if you have a group of friends that's really fitness obsessed and health obsessed, that probably influences your decisions. Conversely, if you have a group of friends that likes to, you know, go get uh, chicken wings and beer every Friday night and get wasted every Friday night, you know, that often increases your food consumption and chances are you don't want to go for a run the next morning too. Also, you could think of social psychology of like just kind of our way of life these days. And our way of life these days is kind of like a go, go, go all the time where we're constantly like grabbing whatever we have while we're doing other things and we're not giving food proper time and attention. So because we feel like we don't have enough time, sometimes we don't cook or sometimes we don't have time for exercise. And this is kind of part of that social psychology influencing our, um, our likelihood to be at a certain size. Physical activity, of course, affects our energy balance as well. This one is the main controllable factor that affects energy balance. And how active we are depends on a whole slew of factors. Some people have a very active job, whereas some people sit on a chair <laughs> all day long. You know, we're at a computer all day long. Also, how much activity we get in our free time. You know, are we sitting on the couch watching TV or playing video games? Or are we out, you know, playing spike ball or volleyball or going for a walk with our friends? Our individual physical activity is probably also influenced by our childhood experiences with exercise and physical activity too. Being someone who was never picked for sports and always kind of seen as a klutz when I was younger, I had a really negative um, relationship with physical activity for a long time until I figured out, you know, what were the things that worked for me. So all of these things can affect how much calories we burn. Plus, of course, there's our environment. Our environment can also influence physical activity levels. So there's a lot of parts in Canada that have a great physical activity environment. I mostly live in Vancouver, and in Vancouver, it is like a physical activity paradise. There's bike trails, there's walking trails, there's hiking trails, lots of mountain biking trails. You can go, you can do so many things all year long. But I also lived in Ontario and in Quebec for a long time in my life too. And, you know, in the winter, uh, you're going to a gym, you're going to an indoor gym because you're probably not going to be running outside. Although there are winter sports like skiing and uh, snowshoeing that are available um, to, when the weather's a little harsher. Uh, but physical activity environment goes beyond just like uh, how many trails there are in the weather. It also it, It's also affected by things like public transit and zoning, like whether there's like a uh, places where people live where there's also stores and in those cases people are more likely to like walk around to get places and of course our physiology the makeup of our body and the way our bodies function affect energy balance too we have different basal metabolic rates we have different hormonal activity we have different genetics and all of these differences affect our appetite and can also affect our physical activity patterns as well Another important physiological component that affects our energy balance are certain key appetite hormones. And there are certain appetite hormones that decrease appetite and there are certain ones that increase it. Okay, and this slide just gives some of these. Okay, so leptin, as we learn, that's secreted by our fat cells when they get larger, this is a stop signal on the hypothalamus. Conversely, ghrelin, which is often known as the hunger hormone, this one like pushes down the accelerator and it's like, let's go, let's eat. And people typically have higher ghrelin levels when they don't sleep properly. And these ghrelin levels often go up right before a meal too. Another satiety signal is something called GLP-1, which, which is secreted by the small intestine. And this, again, is a stop signal on the, the appetite center. And why I mention it, too, is that one of the leading obesity drugs actually promotes GLP activity in order to, again, put that stop signal on uh, the appetite center. So before we judge other people that are, are dealing with obesity or weight-related issues, it's a good it's a good message to take a step back and realize that there's so many complex factors that increase an individual's risk for obesity. And a lot of the times it's so difficult to overcome these factors because we don't even really realize what is influencing our weight. You know, we often say it's eating too much and not exercising enough, but why are we eating so much? Is it an overactive appetite? 
Is it that we're stress eating? And why aren't we exercising enough? Is it because we have negative childhood experiences with exercise? Is it because we just don't know how? You know, and asking some of these questions can help us get to the bottom of what's going to help us stay at a healthy weight, but also gives us a little bit of compassion in seeing that, you know, we don't, we're not all operating with the same set of tools and the same situation.